Welcome to your 10-minute review on rubber dam, sealant, and class 2 restorations for the primary molars. First, we're going to start with rubber dam. Do we need to read rubber dam for all patients? Definitely. Do we need to use it for all procedures? Yep, even the stainless steel crown preparation. This confuses many students because oftentimes with a crown preparation, we don't use a rubber dam. But for the child patient, a rubber dam is so essential that we do use it even for crown preparations. It's a great way to protect the patient from um, aspirating any sort of objects, from having to worry about um, swallowing water. It also protects the cheek and tongues of our wiggly patients to make sure that everyone is safe. It's very important to make sure that we do use a rubber dam even when we do crown preparations. We wanna prevent the patient from aspirating any material such as our stainless steel crown. Hopefully this image stays with you and reminds you for years beyond UCLA that a rubber dam is essential for the child patient. A common issue that I see with students when we're using rubber dams in the general clinic as well as in the pediatric clinic is they're not 100% sure which clamp to use. If you use the right clamp, you're going to be more successful. So here are some clinical tips. The 26N is indicated for a fully erupted permanent molar. Here's a picture of the 26N clamp. You can see that it doesn't um, dig down into the tissues, which is why it's indicated for a fully erupted molar. It's also a nice blade rather than some sharp points, so it can be very um, easy on the gingival tissues as well as onto the crown. So if you're treating a patient and they have a fully erupted permanent molar, such as a nine-year-old, and you're treating tooth number 30, this is a great clamp. If you're treating a younger child and you're planning to clamp a primary molar, the 27N clamp is perfect. This is a very similar clamp to the 26N. You can see that it's a nice blade rather than digging down into the gingiva. And it's a great, it's a little bit smaller, so it's great for primary molars. So if you're treating a four, five, or six year old and you're planning to clamp a primary molar, this is the perfect clamp. The third clamp that you're gonna have available to you in clinic is the 14A. You can see the shape is a bit different. It has some serious four prongs that dig down into the gingiva and the A in signifies that it is an angled gingivally. So A is for angled. That way you remember, you need to have an angled clamp if you're gonna be clamping a primary, I'm sorry, a permanent molar that's partially erupted. The reason this imp is important is that the height of contour is not yet above the gingival margin. So we're not able to get a clamp like the 26N on because it doesn't dig down. The 14A is a great clamp for a partially erupted molar because the angled prongs dig down under the gingiva below the height of contour and can hold the clamp onto the tooth. So if you're seeing a patient who's seven years old and you're treating tooth number three, you're gonna get ready a 14A clamp. Alternatively, if you're treating a 12 or 13 year old patient and you're treating a, primary, or a permanent second molar, then again, you're gonna need to use the 14A. So try to think ahead. Is the tooth fully erupted or partially erupted that you're planning to clamp? Is it a primary or a permanent molar? All of these will help you decide on the best clamp to use and to get ready before your patient arrives. Next step is punching the dam. Whenever you're seeing a pediatric patient, be that a four-year-old to a 14-year-old, everything needs to be ready before we get started, including the dam being on the frame and punched and ready to go. Here are some um, individual steps on how to punch the dam, which we did go over in the preclinical lab. And I'm gonna highlight a few very important points. For one, you wanna make sure that you use the correct size hole of the punch for each tooth that you're putting the um, rubber dam onto. A lot of students tend to use the largest punch hole for every tooth because they remember having a lot of trouble placing a dam in the preclinical lab. This isn't a good idea because then when the holes are too large, the dam does not hold itself in place. It tends to um, pop off of the teeth because it's too big for the tooth in question. If you use the correct size hole for the tooth that you're planning to put the rubber dam onto, then once the dam goes over the tooth, it will snap down below the CEJ and hold itself in place. So that's one reason to use the correct size punch for each tooth that you're um, rubber damming. The other reason is that you wanna have ideal isolation. If the hole is too big for the tooth, then you have gingiva popping through everywhere, you're really not isolating. The other important point is the distance between the holes. If you put the holes too close together, you're gonna to have a lot of stretching and a lot of leakage. If you put the holes too far apart, you're gonna get a lot of um, excessive dam and wrinkles, and it's definitely harder to put on. So a good rule of thumb is about two to three millimeters apart for each hole, and you're gonna direct those holes in a 45 degree angle. 
we only need to punch that tooth that we're um, clamping as well as one to two teeth in front. So we usually clamp the permanent first molar and isolate all the way to the canine. Next, we're gonna have a video of how to punch the dam. First, place the rubber dam frame onto the dam at the top of the, of the dam. That way, you're not closing um, the dam over the patient's nose. Let's go ahead and pause here. So as you saw, I took the rubber dam and I quartered it into quadrants, just the way that we treat a patient. We always treat by quadrants. After you figure out which quadrant you're working in, you're gonna go ahead and place the clamp punch a one half inch in from the frame and, I'm sorry, one and a half inch in from the frame and a half inch down from the midline. So let's go ahead and continue watching. So again, about an, an inch and a half in from the side of the frame and a half inch down from the midline. That's our first punch, that's for the clamp. Then all of our holes need to stay within that quadrant. We're gonna punch the dam at a 45 de degree angle with about two to three millimeters of space between each punch using the correct size hole for each tooth. And there's our dam in a nice 45 degree angle for each tooth, permanent molar to canine. Okay, so you might be thinking to yourself, okay, I've got the right clam, I got my dam ready and punched, but don't kids hate the rubber dam? They really don't if you give them profound anesthesia as well as great tell show do. Remember, the rubber dam is a raincoat. It keeps all the water on the outside, protects them from any sort of extra rain or any extra water. Show them the tooth ring before you get started. This is the ring that's gonna go onto their tooth and it slides right on just like it does on your finger. And you can show them that with the bow of the clamp. You can even put it onto the patient's finger if you want to, but I usually put it on my own. Explain that when the ring goes on, it's a nice tight fit, so it's gonna give a tight squeezing hug, but not a pinch. If they feel a hug, we want a thumbs up, but that's good. If they feel a pinch, we want a thumbs down, and we can go ahead and give them some more local anesthetic. If we don't tell patients about the tight hug, they tend to um, interpret that as pain and they wanna get the dam off. So proper preparation prevents the patient from being upset with the tight hug. Reassure the child also that they can breathe and swallow with the dam on. They're actually gonna be able to breathe and swallow better because they're not gonna have any water in their mouth. Couple of clinical tips. Make sure you always tie floss around the bow of the clamp prior to placement. Never leave a child with the rubber dam unattended and never leave anything in the mouth that's not visible, such as cotton rolls underneath the dam. Here's a video of placing the rubber dam on a dental patient. We wanna make sure that we place the clamp first and check stability and also check for a thumbs up that we're having a nice tight hug, but no pinching. You'll see that I'm using a 26N for a fully erupted permanent molar. And I keep my finger on the clamp to make sure that I have good stability and the clamp doesn't pop off. Next step, check your stability. Stability good. Now go with your rubber dam. Notice that the dam is already on the frame, which is my cheapest assistant. It's gonna keep the dam out of my way so I can see well. Stretch the hole for the bow. The first part of the clamp that's gonna go through is just the bow, don't focus on anything else. After the rubber dam goes over the bow, relax, relax behind the bow to decrease the pressure, prevents your rubber dam clamp from popping off. Then I go with each side of the clamp individually, first sided buckle, then lingual. Now the clamp is secure and inside the dam. Now it's time to pull the rubber dam forward for the individual teeth. Really not taking your hands off the dam at any time because you're keeping that um, gingival pressure. Okay, our dam's on. You can see I continue to relax the dam behind the um, rubber dam clamp to prevent it from popping off. And then your great technique, floss down, then floss again with the same piece of floss without pulling it out. This keeps the dam nice and secure, and then pull out the floss. All right, very good, nice inversion, and we're almost ready to go. Okay, so we've covered rubber dam for the child patient. Let's go ahead and cover class two prep for the primary molar. I know that you guys have done class two preps before, so this is just a quick reminder. Remember that we, um, the uh, you know, ideal outline form should be done first. 
So we don't want to be excavating caries the first step. What we really want to do is an ideal classic class 2 preparation. It's fairly similar for both an amalgam as well as composite. The main difference between amalgam and composite is we don't have to go to um, the pulpal depth of 1.5 millimeters for composite. Usually we're at about one millimeter or still within enamel, but definitely the depth of one millimeter. So that would be the main difference between the two. We wanna make sure that our isthmus width is wide enough, so about one millimeter to 1.25. And then we wanna have our proximal walls that clear the adjacent tooth, both gingivally as well as buccolingually. And that's the same for composite as well as amalgam. Our axial depth of the proximal box should be about one millimeter to 1.25. This is the danger zone. This is where the pull horns are. So we wanna make sure that we're using our 330 burr and doing a nice ideal class two box rather than going too deep axially. The burrs that I recommend are really very classic, 33 burr for the clusal prep as well as starting the box. And then I like to use a 245 burr to create my proximal walls and you'll see why in the next couple of slides. A really important component of the class two preparation for a primary molar is convergence of the box. And this applies to both composite as well as amalgam. We're not using this convergent to have hold the restoration in. We're using the convergence to make sure we don't have undermined enamel. The convergent walls of the proximal box should parallel the buccal and the lingual surfaces at the expense of the gingival. What that means is every box needs to be convergent so we don't have undermined enamel. How do we do it? Well, this is where the 245 burr comes in. It's a nice burr for um, sweeping back and forth within the box, creating a wider gingival floor and a narrow occlusal um, surface. That way we have good 90 degree exit angles that parallel the buccal and the lingual walls as well as a convergent box at the expense of the gingival. So again, our gingival floor is always wider than our occlusal portion of the box. In the clinic, I tend to see students who really flare the box because they're trying to clear both buccal and lingually and gingivally by bringing all the walls out. So remember, you want a convergent box by sweeping the 245 burr, both buccal and lingual. All right, next step is sealants. One of my favorite procedures for our pit and fissure sealants, the first step is always to clean the tooth surface. You're going to use a toothbrush and a, and a, or a profiangle with pumice. Either one is good. I like to use a toothbrush because it's a great time to do oral hygiene instruction and get that in for the patient so that when they leave, they really have a good toothbrushing, OHI, and their sealants. Then you're going to decide on a resin or glass ionomer sealant. Do you remember how we choose between one or the other? Right, a glass ionomer sealant is for a partially erupted tooth that really needs a sealant, such as it has demineralized surface of the grooves of the tooth, but it's partially erupted. So we wanna seal it so it doesn't become a cavity, but we can't use a resin sealant because it's not fully erupted. The next step is to isolate the quadrant and utilize a bite block. Just to review, we're gonna pumice the tooth or use a toothbrush to get all the plaque off the buccal, lingual, and occlusal surfaces. Then we're going to go ahead and isolate the tooth using cotton rolls, a dry angle, as well as a bite block. The next step is, before you get started, verify that your isolation is ideal and give your patient some instructions about staying nice and still, maybe being frozen for the next 60 seconds so that you have a great working field. You're going to always keep your eyes on the tooth. This is really important. You as the operator have to verify that the tooth is never contaminated by saliva. By keeping your eyes on the tooth, you know when to call it quits and tell your assistant, we gotta start over. If you look away, that could be when the patient whips their little tongue out and touches the tooth surface without you noticing. Then your sealant will definitely fail. You're gonna edge the enamel for 20 to 30, sometimes 40 seconds, and rinse with minimal amount of water. The reason we use minimal water is we don't wanna fill all of our cotton rolls and dry angle with tons of water. We wanna use just enough water to get the etchant off and then um, dry the tooth very, very thoroughly so it appears frosty. The next step is to use a hydrophilic dentin bonding agent. This is the same type of bonding agent you're using in the general clinic. The next step after placing your bonding agent is to place the sealant. You can cure these together in one step. So you place your hydrophilic bonding agent, you air thin it, you place your sealant right on top of that and then you polymerize with your light cure. 
When you're placing your sealant, start on the mesial occlusal surface and drag the sealant into the grooves with the sealant tip or the sealant brush. Use gravity to help you. If you put the sealant right in the middle of the tooth, you're always gonna have too much of the distal surface. So start at the mesial and drag it to the distal. Make sure you have no voids and you don't have too much sealant. If you have too much, brush it off with a clean brush. Don't just like cure it, otherwise you're gonna spend all kinds of time polishing it down. After you're happy with the amount of sealant you have and you don't see any voids or bubbles, go ahead and polymerize. Once the tooth has been polymerized, evaluate your sealant for surface coverage and the by checking it with an explorer. You're really gonna try to rip the sealant off with your explorer. If you lost isolation anywhere, the sealant area will pop off. After you've checked the retention and looked for any voids, you're gonna then rinse the tooth for 30 seconds to remove any BPA and floss the contacts. Why do we need to floss the contacts? You'll see in the next photo. So again, place your resin sealant on the mesial occlusal surface, drag it to the distal with the tip of the um, sealant or with a clean brush. I don't like to use an explorer because it tends to contain plaque or some blood from earlier part of the procedure. So I don't use an explorer at this step. Light cure, check for retention, and then rinse the tooth to make sure all the BPA is rinsed. Let's review, let's go back to this slide. Here's our starting procedure, two permanent molars. We're gonna clean the tooth with a profi head and pumice or with a toothbrush brush, which is my preferred method because I like to do OHI at each visit. Then you're gonna isolate really well with your um, saliva ejector, with your dry angle and a bite block. Place your etchant two to three millimeters beyond the area that you want to seal so that you know everything has been well etched. Here we see some lower molars and you can see that they've etched the buckle surface. That's really important. Sometimes students forget to etch the buckle and they only focus on the occlusal. Remember, there is usually a buckle pit or groove. Alternatively, in the maxilla, we wanna make sure that we etch the entire occlusal lingual groove because it does tend to be a deep groove. Ooh, look at these frosty molars, that looks great. And you can see that our cotton rolls are also not really moist. They're very dry still, and that's because our operator used a small amount of water to rinse off the etchant. Now we're ready to place the sealant. We're gonna go ahead and place the sealant on the mesial occlusal portion, drag it to the distal with your brush. If you have too much, take a clean brush and remove any excess. Look for voids and look for bubbles. Remove those before you like here. Here's a brush to remove any excess or to spread it around. Light cure, and then check your integrity of the sealant with an explorer. Make sure you try to pull the sealant off and look for any voids. Uh-oh, this is why we need to floss. Sometimes we get some sealant stuck in between the tooth or some dentin bonding agent. Go ahead and floss it out or use an explorer to come underneath the contact and bring out that part of the sealant. Okay, seems pretty simple, right? Well, we'll do some demos in the clinic and remember, your patient's a moving target, so this gets a little bit more difficult depending on the patient's age. All right, we'll see you in clinic. Go ahead to Angel and complete your assessment to see how this review helped you prepare for your clinical rotation.